Jim, welcome to Tim Said Two. Thanks for joining us on the channel. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Jim, uh, this is going to be, I hope, the first of a multi-part series of interviews with you. You've got a fascinating career, and I'm looking forward to exploring that with you. The guests at home watching this, if they're listening on the podcast, they won't have the advantage, but those at home watching this will see an F-111 behind me, and that's going to be the focus of our conversation today, because that was an aeroplane that you flew, and in particular, your participation in Operation El Dorado Canyon, uh, which was in April 1986, and you're going to talk all about that for us. But but before we get into that, can you give us a quick introduction to who you are and your Air Force autobiography? Um, yeah, I'm Jim Jimenez uh, in the Air Force. I was known as Jose. Um, I started off, uh, went to the Air Force Academy, uh, class of 1979, graduated uh, with a degree in aeronautical engineering, went to pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base in the summer of uh, 79 and 80, uh, became a FAPE which is a first assignment IP, and I was assigned to Williams Air Force Base, which was up in the Phoenix area. Flew the T-38 for three years, and then I received uh, my assignment in the F-111 in 1984. Went through fighter lead-in at Albuquerque, and then uh, went to Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico for F-111 uh, training, and arrived at Lake and Heath in the uh, summer of 1984. And that was my introduction to the UK and Lake and Heath. As far as me personally, I've never had a plan B. I was gonna be a pilot since I was old enough to crawl. My dad was a pilot. He flew in World War II, uh, flew B-26s. Then he went on to fly um, F-86 dogs, the ones with the big nose, and then uh, B-47. So since a little kid, I, I dedicated myself. I was going to be a pilot. That's why I went to the Air Force Academy. That's why I studied aeronautical engineering. That is why I did everything in my life to get to Lake and Heath in the summer of 1984. Did you want to fly fighters then? So that's really interesting. So your dad flew B-26s, F-86Ds, and yes. then B-47s. Um, which of those were you around for to see? I'm guessing... Um... Without a doubt, the B-47, you know? And I can remember being a little boy, and my dad had this very mysterious lifestyle. He would be gone for a week, and I didn't know, but in those days, they were on alert for a week, or they would go on remote alert to all over the world and sit kind of a remote, austere um, presence. But when he came home, he had this big leather satchel of mysterious wonderment. It smelled like fuel, sweat, you know, old leather. And it had a whiz wheel in it. It had maps. It had a flashlight. It just had all kinds of stuff that a little boy or girl would just find incredibly amazing and, and thought provoking. Did he get to see you go to the F-111 then and, and fly? For, fly no. For so my father died a week before I graduated from the Air Force Academy. And one of the big disappointments in my life is I never got to share my flying, my experience with him. Wow. Yeah. He, he, he presumably would have known you were going to make it though. I mean, if, if, oh, yes, yeah. you know, you're, you're by then committed. Uh, he was getting ready to come to my graduation. So yeah, it was in the bag. When my dad talked about flying, it was almost misty eyed. It was like those early pioneer pilots when they talk about God and spiritualism and flying. Flying was never like that for me. It was all more mechanical and just a job. The part that I enjoyed about flying was being the professional athlete, being part of a team, you know, working together to accomplish <clears throat> something. That was the part of flying I liked. The mechanics of flying up, takeoff, landing, maneuvering the airplane, eh, I couldn't care less. Well, that's interesting. Because so, so one thing we'll, we'll get on to at some point in this series mm -hmm. of interviews then is you went to Air Force Test Pilot yeah. School. You became a test pilot, um, yeah. which I suppose um, is an, the embodiment of that approach, isn't it? Less about the sort of romanticism of it and more about the, the physics. 
Yeah, and to tell you the truth, I I managed my career to failure. I ended up purposely doing things that I asked to do, and at the end, I regretted it. And test pilot school and being a test pilot is one of those. It wasn't until after I got into that world that I decided and knew I don't want to be here. I want to be operational. I wanted to be back where the other guys are. This is boring. I don't like this. Wow. Okay. Well, well, yeah. we will we will explore that in probably yeah. part two of this series. Yeah, that's a good primer for me, though. I d- I didn't realize that. I w- one of the questions I was going to ask was because you you know again the audience will find out eventually. But you ended your tour on uh, on white jets flying uh, as a squadron commander of a T thirty eight air education training command squadron, and I was going to ask you how you went from test pilot school to or from being a <laughs> test pilot to that. Um, so 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 don't answer right now. But uh, okay. But, but I'll I'll ask you, and we'll we'll get the audience to come back and, and listen to the answer on on that. Okay. Great. Okay, so 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 having understood, then you've got this um, infusion of aviation in you that comes from your father, and you have all of the um, the accoutrements that go with it the the smells, the the sounds, the sights, all those things. Um, did you, when you got to the F one eleven, then were you, were you happy? Was that the airplane you wanted? Was it your top pick? Absolutely not. You know, I was a uh, a fate a T thirty eight IP. And I had graduated first in my class in pilot training. I expected to get the fighter I wanted. Um, I was married at the time uh, to another active duty officer and we got a joint assignment. So they thought they were doing me a favor by putting us together in Phoenix. She was an officer at Luke Air Force Base and I was at Williams, opposite sides of the city. Um, But we were together in a joint assignment and I was an assistant first assignment IP, I wanted to go to fighters. I wanted that F-15. I wanted that F-15 or that F-16 or that A-10 or that F-4, you know, and I got the T-38. So I was disappointed then. I um, At Williams, I worked my butt off to do well. I got a master's degree in aero on my own time at Arizona State University. I flew 1,500 hours in the T-38. I taught academics. Uh, aerodynamics and T-38 systems, but I wasn't one of the handsome golden pilots at Williams. And when the wing commander ranks and stacks all of his fates that are gonna get an assignment, I was like towards the middle. So I got what I considered a second tier fighter. They still called it a fighter, an F-111, and it broke my heart. I went that weekend and had a bender and felt sorry for myself and considered leaving the Air Force. Uh, Maybe I can go do something else, rejoin the guard, give it another shot someplace else. But um, I talked myself out of it and decided, hey, I've still got uh, six years in the Air Force. I'm going to give it a shot, try to go there with a good attitude and talked myself into making believe it was the assignment I wanted from the beginning. Hmm. So I got out of that weekend, tried to turn a new page and attack the F-111 with as good of a feeling and attitude that I could. One of the things that you you hear when people talk about assignments, and you've just said you wanted the F F fifteen or F sixteen or you know F four A ten, is is the mission is important. What was part of the consolation for you the importance of the mission of the F one eleven at the time? Can you talk a little bit about why Lake and I was totally a, ignorant of, of the mission of the F one eleven. It was just a big airplane that didn't turn. You know, it was big. You know, and reading what I knew, it was like flying with one eye stabbed out. You know, when you sit in the F-111, you know, you're looking in a in a capsule. It's like flying a Gemini space capsule. You know, it's got visibility out the front, but geez, you, you might as well put a patch over your right eye. Um, and when you think about turning, that's all you're doing is you're just thinking about it. You're not actually turning, you know. So um, I was very disappointed that the manly man flew air-to-air fighters from um, World War I through the Battle of Britain, through Korea, Vietnam, 
and I wasn't going to be one of them. And that broke my heart. What was your, you know, what was your introduction to the F one eleven like? Then how how quickly were you able to, as you said, you know, you so you felt a bit sorry for yourself, but you decided you were going to make a go of it and and yeah. and, and do the best that you could. How how long did it take to put that behind you? Did did you put it behind you? I, I put it uh, behind me immediately. You know, when it started with uh, fighter lead in training. Um, you know, they send everybody going to fighters through an, another T thirty eight course you know, if you will, I found that exceedingly easy, but I applied myself and I did really well and better than anyone else that was going through that course. So I kind of proved that, Hey, just cause I'm going to the 111, don't think I don't have some chops, you know, we, you know, 111 guys can do this and we've got some skills. And I use that as like a red badge of courage, you know, through lead in training. And then at Cannon, the, the 111 is an intimidating airplane. You don't need to buck yourself up to get excited to get in there. It's got 30 ways it wants to kill you, you know, and it is. And in those days, it was an emergency just waiting to happen um, that I thought. And so I was immediately engrossed and fully consumed with trying to operate the airplane correctly. Tell us about some of those um, alarming characteristics, then the ways in which it could could try to kill you. Um, first off, the airplane has 31,000 pounds of internal fuel, 31,000. And when that fuel burns off, the CG of the airplane changes incredibly. So you've got to be aware of um, your slab position, the flight control computers, everything is working correctly. And when you get light on fuel, that airplane can get really dicey in the longitudinal axis. So just flying the airplane um, in the longitudinal axis as you burn down fuel and you're carrying stores and being aware of your CG is a big deal. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the first airplane was what we call, uh, I would call it um, electronic flight control systems. Um, it's got computers that um, voted your input in the stick and it overrode your input, input to fly the airplane the way the computers thought. And you better understand those computers because they could kill you in 12 different ways. So all the different failure modes of the computers. The other thing is it had um, a very complicated hydraulic system because it had to use um, all this pressure to move the wing sweep. It had, um, um, so that was another failure mode that if you lost certain hydraulic pressure, you couldn't move the wings. Um, the uh, master caution panel, on the T-38, the master caution panel is the size of your four fingers. You know, it's got two rows and it's got like eight lights, you know, four on each side. It's very simple. You know, you got more cautions now on a modern car than you did on a T-38. Okay, but in the F-111, it's like six rows across, six down, and then they ran out of things to warn you about. So some of these lights meant two or three different things. So you would flip open your checklist and the checklist was this light on and this light on, but not this one or this light and this light and this light. You would go to a different page. So your emergency checklist page was like that. Thick. It was ridiculous. So when we would do these dial a disaster emergency sims, you know, in the F-111, I walked out like a, a lip noodle. It was just physically and mentally exhausting, making sure you were in the proper checklist. Um, and then the engines were the first after burning turbofan engines, all the guys that fly the F-14 um, could tell you the same thing. Uh, when they worked, they worked okay. They worked really well. But there was a lot of problems um, building up those engines. And they could throw turbine plates. They could um, compressor stall. There could be fuel leaks in the afterburner section. There was a lot of ways those engines just kind of blew up. So um, until I got comfortable with the airplane and really familiar with the systems 
and how to manage the things that could go wrong. Yeah, it was an intimidating airplane. And then couple that with hurtling as fast as you can without being able to see where you're going, you know, relying on electronics, which for the first part of the course is teaching you how often they can fail. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what about flying with a, a WIZO then? So you would have, obviously as a FAPE, you would have been teaching, so you would have been used to flying in the airplane with somebody else. That's part uh -huh. of being a FAPE, I suppose. But um, how about adjusting to having a WIZO in the airplane with you? That, is that easy? I enjoyed it immensely. I really enjoyed it. And I in particular, I flew the F-15 and the F-15E later in my career and uh, have some time in the F-4 as well. And the difference of flying with the Wizzo in the 111 compared to all those other airplanes is they were up front with me. We were sitting side by side and we were a team. And it was that concept of being a team equal, working together, keeping each other alive, um, synergy to complete something so i got uh, i enjoyed flying with somebody else in the front seat uh we stroked each other's backs uh we gave each other confidence and we bucked each other up when we needed to tell me about your arrival at lake and ethan um, and can you talk a little bit about the f111f we i've had i've had the fortune good fortune of having brad insley on the channel he's talked a lot about he flew the f111 during vietnam he's talked a lot about the f111 i think he is generally referred to as mr f111 i think maybe one of your fellow raiders is the only other guy who's got the same number of sort of hours as as brad insley yeah. um i won't name him but uh, i know of him um and i've had uh, marco uh, mccaffrey on the channel he flew the f111e but we uh, it would be interesting to hear about the differences um, between the F-111F and the others and what made the F special and what it was doing at Lake and Heath, why it was stationed at Lake and Heath. Um, you grew up in Newmarket, didn't you? I did, yeah. Around that area? I did, yeah. Were you ever around Lake and Heath when the F-111s were there? Oh, yes, yeah. You know, then you, then you know this. When an F-111 took off, the... The word, the earth shook. It was the single loudest, most intimidating airplane I have ever heard take off. So as a brand new pilot, I was a captain by then. I had been promoted after being a fate, but I arrived as a brand new F-111 pilot, but I hadn't checked out in the F model yet. And I'm wearing my blue suit and I'm walking around the base with my wife and we're kind of doing the in processing and a two ship of F-111s take off and it scared the crap out of me. I mean, the whole ground is shaking and it is vibrating. And then just through the buildings, there's this airplane with a sheet of 15 foot flame in the middle of the day out the back end. And women and children are crying and I'm plugging my ears. And it was just the most awesome, impressive thing I had ever seen. And everybody just kind of came to a standstill and the airplane goes away and now we can talk again. And this happened every time a plane took off, whether you were in the BX buying diapers, the commissary buying milk, out at the track jogging when an f-111 took off people just stopped trying to communicate you waited until it was done and then you resumed the conversation so the airplane first off was a beast you go in those days um the f-111 went to a lot of air shows and the f model was always the hit you know the the aviation enthusiasts can enjoy the skill of a pilot doing aerobatics uh, and a nice tight aerobatic performance. But the crowd wants flame and noise and the F-111F had them both. So when it made a pass and it put it into burners, it just knocked the place down. So it was an impressive airplane. Uh, later on, I got a story about um, what's the RAF college uh Cromwell. that's near the midlands what cromwell yeah Crom we did a flyby by cromwell and i got a call that they said oh my god that was the most impressive flyby they had ever seen they were still 
hold in their hearts, knocked them over on the parade field in Cromwell, you know? So, so that was that. Then uh, the airplane itself was uh, a big T-38. It flew uh, like a heavy T-38. It was very easy to fly. All the F-11s I found were very easy to fly as long as everything worked well. It was managing the uh, TFRs and the flight control computers when they didn't work well. That was uh, very challenging. Uh, explain the TFR. Most of the audience will, will know what it is, but, but, but for the sake of... So, uh, in those uh, days, uh, the, the world had not invented integrated avionics or integrated airplanes. Everything was an add-on. It was at a piece of equipment. Think about those old stereo systems in the 70s. You had a turntable, then you had something on top of that, then you had something on top of that. You had a stack of components to make your stereo system that was four feet tall. The 111 had a great big, huge nose because of the attack radar. And in those days, we didn't have computer enhancement in order to do what we call uh, beam Doppler sharpening of the, of the image. So the bigger the radar dish, the more resolution you could have on your returns. And the F-111 was going to perform uh, interdiction and drop bombs in all weather. And it was gonna be a radar delivery airplane primary. So you needed a big radar dish to give you the resolution on the ground returns in order to distinguish the target. So you got this big radar dish in front and it was mechanical, it went like this and like this, and it was controlled from the right seat. Then right underneath that big radar dish, you had two TFR um, little antennas that were completely separate, redundant, separate, completely different. And they were controlled by a panel in the center of the airplane. And they kind of, fun like this. We usually put one in this mode and the other in one of these modes like this as a redundancy. So they're going like this the whole time. And their job was to just look at where the airplane's about to go and to compute a ride line based on your set clearance plane to fly you automatically over that terrain. So you could uh, fly automatically at 200 feet up to 1,000 feet with different increments in between. And then the flight control system, different from all of that, um, you could plug it in and it would sequence between turn points. So once you got low level and you plugged in the TFRs, the TFRs are going up and down and you couple the flight control system and now the airplane is doing all of its turns uh, by itself as it sequences to different turn points. Um, that's pretty cool. Then uh, up on the airplane too, it has a uh, radar warning receiver, completely different than all those other things to warn you of uh, uh, radar lock-on and other radars looking at you. Uh, the other thing, it had an HF radio that was kind of unique for a fighter type airplane. We could uh, call long range um, uh, on the HF radio, listen to BBC radio on the HF. It was really kind of a neat add-on. And uh, then you had chaff and flares, completely different. And you had your weapons um, control panel, completely different. Your bombing modes that kind of tied everything together. And then on the right side, a control panel to input what was the first generation of computer uh, inputs into a very rudimentary onboard computer. And last but not least, it had a submarine inertial navigation system. That same submarine they built for uh, Polaris submarines, this great big platform that weighed about 200 pounds and it was about this big. And it had spinning gyros going each way and accelerometers. And when it was working, it worked really well, but there was a lot of moving parts and now all inertials are with uh, ring laser gyros, the old days of actually spinning something on it and trying to measure the precession of that spin is gone. But the F-111 had it. And then finally, we never used it. Um, it had a star tracker. 
the FBs had it and the Ds had it where if you lost everything, you're inertial or you didn't know where you were, you were the right seater could point to a prominent star, either the sun, the moon, Polaris, something like that. And if you track that star and given the, the time of day, time of night, the computer and the system would know where you are. And it was like trying to figure out your latitude the old fashioned way with the sextant. So um, it was a modern sextant built into the airplane. So it had all this stuff and uh, my crewmate and I were in charge of it. Pretty cool. Tell, okay, so I did not. Okay, I did not know that you had an INS from a, a submarine, a nuclear submarine. That's incredible. The idea that yeah. this thing that doesn't probably move at more than thirty knots definitely doesn't yeah. pull many Gs. That you'd stick that in a in a in a fighter. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, the the Star Tracker then. Okay, nerdy question because I've always been curious about it. Is that what goes ahead of the forward canopy combing? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, the Star Tracker was, um, you can see it on the FBs easier because they just painted over all the other models. It might not even have been um, input in the F, but on the Ds, it was still there. And the As, um, they painted over, but it was completely flush. So unless you knew where it was, you wouldn't know where to do it. Yeah. The last year or two of the F-111, they did what was called an avionics improvement mod or something like that. And they put GPS and that was kind of like a, a burner flat plate right in front of the windscreen. And you see that now in some photos. And that's prominent. That looks like a, a hot plate in front of the windscreen that comes up about an inch or two above the windscreen. And that was the GPS antenna for the GPS mod. Um, the I think the emission that you've made is PaveTac. Uh, and then... I forgot the pave tac. So the pave tac, oh my gosh. So this thing was invented in Vietnam and the F4 guys called it uh, pave drag. You put it on the F4 and it was just um, 2000 pounds of weight that instead of uh, a center line fuel tank, you put this thing on the center line. It was really draggy. It puts this, this uh, head that came down, but it was at the time, cutting art fidelity with finding differences in temperature. So it really gave you an infrared image that for even today is pretty high fidelity. When we talk about uh, the number of um, degrees that can be determined, the pave tack is still pretty good up there. They, um, a, uh, Old F-111 guy by the name of Colonel Ed Braxton was instrumental in um, pushing through the pave tack integration on the F model. So they took the weapons bay and they built a harness and a pivot for the pave tack and modified the weapons bays a little bit. So this great big huge pave drag, instead of being hung on the center line, it just rotated around in the weapons bay and then the seeker head would come out and um, would um, be an infrared image that the right seater could maneuver, search, or um, sync up to the radar point and fire a laser. And that's what we use to um, uh, designate laser guided weapons. And in the F-111, we never called it draggy. You know, it was, I, I couldn't tell if the pave tack pod was extended or not. It was just no notice on the airplane. Couldn't even hear it rotate around. That airplane was so big. We were going so fast. It was a non-event to put that thing out, in my opinion. Tell us, Jim, about the mission then of, of the 48th Fighter Wing, or uh, back then it would have been the Tactical Fighter Wing. Um, wh which squadron were you in, first of all? And um, um, I was assigned to the 493rd, you know, okay. but everyone, when they get to um, Lake and Heath, they went through the Greens, the 495th, which was the training squadron. And then out of that, I was assigned to the 493rd. Um, the first thing you do is you got to do a strike cert, nuclear cert. And um, that was a big deal. Steve, I mean, we um, 
I think it was Star Baby talked about his nuclear certs in the F-15E. And I was I chuckled because I'm glad to hear it's still going on. Um, when I saluted and reported to my commander in the 493rd, who ended up um, leading the raid on Libya, um, he said, Jim, hey, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, hey, I can tell you, I can help you and I want to support you in everything, but there's two ways you can screw up. I can't help you. You screw up on alert with the nukes, can't help you. You're gone. And um, you get a DUI. Other than that, I'm there for you. And that nuke cert, it was 100% pass or fail. You know, it was no room for a mistake. And we all took that very seriously because we sat uh, Victor Alert at least maybe once a month, twice a quarter, or something like that. So, so the the F one eleven has a, a nuclear strike role. Um, where, where were you going to? You don't have to tell your target if yeah. you don't want to. But wh where were you generally going to be going and and taking? Uh, I role? sat I sat three different lines uh, when I was on Victor Alert. One of them went way up north and um, into the uh, Baltic and into what used to be one of the Soviet republics on the coast. Think of flying east of Sweden. <laughs> and um, the other two lines were east of Berlin, you know, <laughs> uh, into um, East Germany. One was in Poland, the other two were in East Germany. How much time then when you're a, a, a frontline fighter pilot in at Lake Anith then, how much time are you spending practicing that nuclear strike mission? How much time are you spending practicing a conventional strike mission? Well, uh, good question, but I would say um, we did it all the same. They were seamless because we thought our tactics for our conventional missions were going to be primarily the same as our strike mission. We were going to go in and do a radar laydown, or we were going to toss a bomb miles away. Those were our two deliveries, just a low level lay down, release it and keep going or do a toss and sling the bombs away so we could get some standoff. Now saying that when we trained at Lake Eney, every day that we flew, I had two bomb dispensers on the wings, one on each of the inboard pylons. So I had 12 practice bombs and the number one objective of each training sortie was to get rid of all your bombs. So we had a half dozen practice bombs and man, a good sortie was getting rid of 12 practice bombs out on one of the, the ranges. And normally I could only get rid of two or three, you know, because we got kicked off the range or we didn't have range time, but we always tried to do um, overhead dive bombs. We did tens and 15 degrees um, visual bombing. And in the history of the F-111, I don't think anybody ever did a low angle, low drag or a low angle visual delivery from the F-111, but we practiced the hell out of them in Lake and Heat. Uh, explain a little bit about, um, well, maybe, maybe you'll explain it later, but I, I was going to ask you a question around uh, flying the airplane when it's heavy. So you're carrying those little BDU 33s. I think they're called the, what are they? 26 pounds each. You know, something yeah, something like that. Like so that. You, you don't have a lot of weight on the airplane. They're representative of maybe a Mark 82 ballistically. Yeah. Um, but, but, but where are you flying the airplane heavy? When, you got to fly El Dorado Canyon. Presumably the airplane was heavy when you did that. Were you used to flying the airplane heavy? Uh, Yes, because um, on every exercise, we practice the end of the world. And what I mean by the end of the world is every exercise started the same. Um, Lake and Heath, they had a base PA system. And when the exercise kicked off, they played the William Tell Overture. And there was a big voice that came in that said, all personnel report to your battle station, something right out of World War II. You know, report to your stations. This is the wing command post. Report to your battle station. Uh, in those days, we were a forward deployed force. You know, now it's a um, uh, it's more of a expeditionary type of air force. And Lake and Heath is an expeditionary force. But in those days, we expected to fight 
and die right there at Lake and Heath. And we had the tab V's, the hardened shelters. We had controlled points. We had sandbags around the base where you could jump in if we got under a, an attack. We took it really serious. So the exercise would start with us conventionally and we practice doing conventional strikes and stopping the hordes through the Arden forest. And every once in a while in those first few days, we did a selected release, which is a euphemism for a strike sortie, you know, to try to stop the hordes from coming further. But at the end, up, oh, that's it. Nothing's working. It's Armageddon. And we launched the fleet. And we did an elephant walk with two tanks each. And we all took off 48 airplanes. Usually the elephant walk was 48 airplanes. And we launched off to the world with two tanks and flew for three to four hours and came back and landed. And each exercise kind of went like that. So, yeah, I'd flown with full tanks. And that was really about as heavy as our El Dorado Canyon airplanes were. It wasn't super heavy. We weren't even close to uh, max gross weight because we only carried uh, two bombs on each wing instead of uh, um, 12 or 24 Mark 82s that we could to get maxed out. Can I ask you then about the... You, you talked about the wing sweep in the sense that uh, the hydraulic system was complex and if it failed, the wings would get stuck where they were. Uh, one of the things that's noteworthy for a modeler like me is when I make a model of something like an F-111 and I've, it's got three pylons on each wing, I notice that the sort of two outboard pylons don't rotate with the wing sweep. So they're fixed. Um, is that is that correct then? And, and what are the implications for flying the aeroplane if you've got sort of the, the middle or the outboard pylons in a fixed position and they're carrying something? Crappy, just crappy, you know? So the F-111 had four pivot pylons, two on each wing. And the um, F airplanes, that's all they had. That's all I ever flew with were pivot pylons. Never a clean wing. Every airplane I flew in the F-111 had four pivot pylons, two on each wing. The FB models, you know, that were part of SAC, that were in Plattsburgh and Pease, um, they had the capability of putting on additional fixed wing pylons outside of those. So they could put um, fuel tanks and those were not pivotal. They were locked at 26 degrees. So as long as you, you took off and they were candid kind of in a little bit and looked funky as hell. And then as soon as you, they took off, they could sweep the wings back to 26 and now they were streamlined with the airplane and then the idea was they go towards bad guy land and when those fuel tanks are dry they jettison them and then they can sweep their wings as normal did you say jim right at the beginning that you got to lake and in the summer of 84 yes you got in the summer of 84 so there was nine months or um sorry 18 months or so until the raid happened the raid was april of yeah so the uh el dorado canyon happened um for me, it really started in a Christmas of 85, um, that time frame. I can't remember if it was New Year's or Christmas, but that dead period somewhere between Christmas and New Year's is the first time I ever heard of it, of planning about it. And if you remember in those days, we already had the Beirut bombing in 83. We had the Navy lose in A6 shortly thereafter. We had the Achille Laro incident on the cruise ship. We, the Navy intercepted um, like the terrorist airplane and forced it down into Sigonella, if you remember that incident. Then we've had a couple of, of incidences and the Libyans and the line of death with the Navy. It was all kind of building up. But I first kind of took it seriously um, when we were called in and in brief. And um, my plan, the way I heard it, is, hey, we're on alert for a possible reprisal to Libya. Here's a set of potential targets. We uh, plan on launching six airplanes to get four across the target. It's going to be a small raid, but we want the crews that are identified to know who they are. And they started identifying crews. 
So I was hard crewed with a very experienced uh, Wizzo um, who was a weapon school grad, a Stanny Val um, Wizzo, probably the most highly regarded Wizzo in the whole wing, in my opinion. He's just forgotten more about weapons employment than most of us would ever know. And they crewed me with him because um, they liked me, but I was the youngest pilot in that group, the least experienced. So they wanted an old head to kind of help bring me along. So sometimes uh, we were part of that group and sometimes we weren't. And there was um, an incident that happened in like March uh, the Navy ended up sinking a couple of Libyan patrol boats and they fired something. And I can't remember exactly what happened, but I thought if we were going to go, that was when we were going to go. And it was in March. And I just forgot about it. I go, well, it's not the Air Force. It's not us. We're out of it. And I forgot all about it. And the next time that I heard about it was Sunday after church on April 13th. So we had gone to church, had gotten home. This is a Sunday. The base happens to have a scheduled exercise that's gonna kick off on Monday. So I get the call and it says, Jose, uh, you gotta come to work, get your flight gear and report to the 494th. And I said, crap. You know, to go and fly with a to, to, to go and fly with a different fighter squadron is kind of like going on a bad date. You know, no matter how good the movie is, you never want to see each other again. So I'm going to go now to our rival fighter squadron, bring my stuff. And I knew what I was going to do. I had been chosen to go prep jets for the exercise. They always need somebody to move the wing sweep, to ride the brakes, to do the checks, to do something, and they need rated folks to help maintenance get ready for the exercise. So I was convinced I was gonna do that. When I showed up to the 494th, there was a great big brand new radar uh, satellite dish out in front and there was an armed guard. And he looked at my ID and they had never had an armed guard to get into the building, any building um, where the crew are. And I thought that those bastards had gotten satellite TV. I go, how did those guys get direct TV into the squadron? But when I got in, um, they told me, Jose, you're part of the group. And that's when I found out that the mission had morphed from launching six to get four into launching 24 to get 18. And I was number three of this 18. And um, for the next day, we prepped and flight plan for the mission. And it just got to be more and more surreal. Um, I had uh, the buddy that you mentioned, the high time F-111 guy, the only guy that comes close to Brad Inslee. Uh, him and I were pretty good friends. And um, we started talking about the indicators. Hey, and I was saying, you know, Dick, no way this is going on. Just no way are they going to launch us. 24 airplanes? Are you kidding me? There's not enough tankers, you know, to support this number of airplanes. No way can they do it. Well, we went out to get something to eat, and I drove past Mildenhall. And there were 12 KC-10s already on the ramp at Mildenhall. We come back and I go, well, the indicators are moving up a little bit. That was a good indicator. The flight surgeon came in and gave me actual amphetamines and barbiturates, go and no-go pills. He goes, you, knew I, you guys are going to be keyed up tonight. If you're having trouble sleeping, take two of these, you know, get a good night's sleep, and then put these in your pocket if you need something the next day as a pick me up, it's gonna be a long flight. Take one of these one at a time. Actual real narcotics, you know? And I'm going, man, that's an indicator. Pretty good indicator. 
They um, handed out firearms. We had always used kind of the aircrew firearm in exercises, but they passed out firearms with ammunition. Whew. That's an indicator, you know. Um, hey, here's your code book. In case we need to get in touch with you, we'll be contacting you in code. Here's the um, code letters and code words. Uh, that's top secret. Make sure you don't lose that. That was an indicator, you know. So all these indicators are coming up, but the biggest indicator that I saw was uh, we are getting ready to uh, step out to the jets. It's finally been a day, uh, a day and like four hours. And we're getting ready to step to the jets and we're in the mass briefing room and the uh, General McInerney is in the room. He's a three-star general. And the room is called to attention and we all stand up and it's the chief of staff of the Air Force, the biggest officer of the Air Force, General Gabriel. And he walks down to the center and he only says like five to 10 seconds worth of something. And the gist of what he said for the first time since World War II, Allied aircraft will launch from the UK in harm's way. Wow. Good luck. Wow. That's an indicator. You know? Wow. Okay. And then the next guy to get up was the DO. And the DO is a full bird colonel, the guy that enforces the rules and tells you not to crash, the guy that will ruin your career if you fly too low or you do something stupid in an airplane and he gets up and he says, it's vital that we keep the runway clear. If you've got a problem, you take it off into the dirt, but do not clog up the airplane, you know, abort. And if you can't clear at the end, take it off into the dirt. That's an indicator, you know? So then we step out to the jet and I'm in the crew van with our flight, the four remits, the three of us in the airplanes um, and the remit one, two, three, and the spare remit three, four. And we're in the crew van, van and we're going to the jet and I'm sitting right next to the commander, that same commander that told me about screwing up. And I go, boss, I know this is a, um, this is a bad time to bring this up, but I've never refueled from a KC-10 before. <laughs> And he looks at me like Ward Cleaver to the beaver, you know? He goes, Jose, now is not the time. He'll do just fine, you know? <laughs> so we, we launched and took off. And we did not say a thing on the radio uh, until uh, off the target from that point on. Wow. So we took off. And armed with uh, lights from a mobile unit telling us a green light. And we launched off. And all I did was go 15 seconds after the guy in front of me. And our flight took off, rejoined on our tanker. I think Lake and Heath is something like 06 and 24, the runway orientation. We took off on runway 24, uh, the runway at Mildenhall. And by then they had like 24 KC-10s at Mildenhall by then. Another indicator. You could see the tails out there in the horizon when we're in the jet. Just shark tails everywhere. It was the most awesome thing you'd ever seen. And they take off, I think like 2810, something like that. So the tankers took off uh, due west on like 28. We took off on 24 and we just did a fighter lead in rejoin to our tanker. And I stayed on that tanker all the way until the drop off point from takeoff visual rejoin um, out of Lake and Heath and Mildenhall stayed on that tanker with them until we went lights out and fell off the tanker approaching um, Italy. Okay. Jim, let me take you back then before we before we get to the mission proper then. Let me let me take you back to the to the Christmas time or the, the January time of, of, of eighty six. When you say you were the original plan was for six aircraft to hit four targets, is that what you said? Well, and it was uh it was really unspecified. We thought it was gonna be a um 
a reciprocal uh, target uh, a response that was going to try to be um, limited. You know, something was going to be blown up and instead of um, a lot of damage, we wanted a surgical strike on something of significance, whether it was a training site, uh, one of the targets was an oil pumping station. Uh, one of them was the military side of the international airfield, you know, and we didn't know if all four planes were going to go to the same target or if we were going to have separate targets. But there was a target list. We kind of knew the general route of flight that we would go and where we would come off. And we were just studying intel and the route to the target. Were you expecting at that point to travel across French and Spanish airspace? Um, we had to plan both ways. Okay. And some of the sneaky things is we were going to go as a, a call sign for um, an Air Force tanker or um, <laughs> an international airliner, you know, take off and just fly some, you know, in one of the international air routes and then just disappear. Fantastic. Um, so, so let me ask about the crew selection then. Why you and why were you? So it sounds like the 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 wizard's a no brainer if he's he's the best guy in the wing. But um, what, why select you? And and and, and uh, I don't want to ask who who the other people were, but were the other were the other people in that original six? Were they um, much more experienced? Were they a range of different experience levels? Yes, everyone. Uh, the was the Wizzos, uh, everyone was very experienced. I was the youngest aircraft commander chosen, you know, um, and the least experienced. Everyone else had two or three um, um, tours in the F-111, had thousands of hours. I probably had 200 hours or 300 hours in the airplane, and that was all. But I am sure the reason they took me is... I never boarded. I always took off on that airplane. Um, in those days, the F-111 had a rather poor mission capability rate. And it was very common to work maintenance for an hour before takeoff when you got to the jet. And I briefed my guys, the people that I flew with, my crew Wizzo, a guy named Larry Smith, hey, as long as it's not safety of flight, as long as we have electrics and a hydraulics, we're going, you know, we're not going to work any electronics, you know, uh, if the radar doesn't work too bad, if the TFRs don't work too bad, if all this magic, if the inertial doesn't work too bad, and we fly it like a T-38, but we always took off on time. And I got that reputation, you know, one of these schedulers in my squadron and the commander was there. He goes, Jose, how many hours have you got? You're the high guy in the squadron. You know, how did you get so many hours? And I said, I never abort, you know, I take off. So I kind of got that reputation as a guy that got off the ground, that did it. You know, I wasn't afraid to fly with nothing working in that airplane. And uh, so I had a tendency to fly it like a T-38 um, when that happened. And we would go out and we'd do uh, manual bombing with no magic all the time. I'd go out and I would call trolling for blokes out over the Wash ATA to mix it up with the Benbrook F-4s or the Lucas F-4s, you know, go out just stirring up a hornet's nest, trying to find something to do with that airplane. And um, th I think that's why they chose me. I got off the ground and I, and I did it. With regards to uh, the, the makeup then of those um, air crew, were they all 493rd? No. So they had um, all crews. And in fact, by that time, I had moved as an IP to the 495th. So I was really assigned to the 495th. And so was my Wizzo. He was a Stanny Val and he had become an instructor Wizzo in the 495th. So we had, um, I don't know how many 495th crews. We might have been the only 495th crew. Um, but there were um, at least six from each of the other squadrons, you know, um, six blue guys, six red guys, and six yellow guys. And I was one of the yellow guys. So maybe only five, you know, or eight, one of the yellow guys. 
Um, so it was the whole wing that furnished crews. Hey everybody, it's Steve, your host, with a brief interruption from your scheduled programming. Just to remind you that my book, Red Eagles, America's Secret Migs, is available for order on my website and exclusively through my website. The book tells the story of the 4477th Test and Evaluation Squadron and Constant Peg, the program that used covertly acquired MiGs to expose the threat to the tactical air forces through the 1970s and 1980s. It's a great story. It's been out of print for a while but it is now back in print and is available for a very reasonable price. If you'd like to support the channel, I'd really appreciate it. And you can go to the website, I'll put a link up above and in the description and order the book, or you can buy any of the other merchandise on the website, including the polo shirt that you see me wearing in this episode. Thank you for your support. Um, I wanted to talk about planning then and the evolution of the planning and you've kind of already answered some of that question because you said you kind of forgot about it and then the Sunday before it happened I think it happened on the 15th the night of the 15th didn't it so um you know it was a day and a half like you said before it happened you were told you're, you're on it so you kind of answered some of that question but I interviewed Puffy one too um and you listened to that and privately you said to me I can understand why he's frustrated because he was a weapon school guy very experienced and he was pissed that he was not involved in the planning process Going back then to the simple plan, in inverted commas, and, and what you were briefed in on uh, at that Christmas time in 85, were you guys allowed to, to input into the planning for that particular sort of restricted uh, response option type, type mission, or was that also la laid out for you? No, it was, it was the, um, the assumption was that there was going to be a, a warning message or an alert message, get ready to do something, plan it out. And then there would be an execute and we would have a day, days to actually plan it out. And the crews uh, would plan out their attack individually. And that's what we were doing when we were on. We would go, well, if we got executed in the next hour, uh, we would drop off from the tanker here and we'd want a TFR this route around these known sites and come up from the south going north. And it was very much crew um, involved in planning and doing that kind of what if, what they smaller target set. When um, the actual execute order came down and it was 24 airplanes airborne to launch 18, there were two things, three things that became immediately clear to me. They didn't need the young whippersnapper to offer any good ideas. They were overloaded, you know? So my job was to shut up and color, okay? And that's all I did. I stayed out of the way and I didn't want somebody to look at me and go, Jose, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And they replaced with somebody that knew what they were doing. So I just tried not to piss anybody off. Somebody like Puffy One Two was starting to get the Mozambique, because hmm. here they are. We're about ready to go to combat. We're about ready to execute this big plan, and nobody was asking the square root of jack shit. You know, nobody was being involved and asked what they wanted to do. This was all being controlled and planned from a very core, small group of folks at Wings Weapon. And that pissed uh, a lot of folks off, okay? I understood it, and it didn't piss me off because that was one thing. One of the big considerations is we're not going alone. We're going with the Navy. And the Navy gets really nervous with fast movers going anywhere near the fleet that aren't positively identified, you know? So, man, the, and the Navy's got some robo ships out there that will just freaking smack you down. So the last thing you wanted to do was be someplace that the Navy didn't want you because they would shoot first and they'd already done it. They'd shot down an F4 like six months before or something, you know. So that was a major consideration of being kind of facetious. But the um, staying deconflicted from the Navy was a huge element. And in fact, we put one of the wing um, leaders on the Coral Sea to coordinate with the Navy to make sure that it was uh, deconflicted and they knew where we were coming and they knew not to shoot us. 
that guy who went on the Coral Sea ended up retiring as a three-star general, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, pretty, pretty stout leadership there in the wing to, to send somebody like that. Um, the other thing is I think the political leadership was scared to death of another uh, Beirut captive, like happened two years before with the Navy shoot down. Um, you know, we didn't want anybody to be held captive and hostage to make matters worse. So they were looking for a high profile um, in your face attack, but they wanted to minimize uh, the possibility of an airplane going down inside of Libya. Hmm. You know, TFR and, um, from the south side coming up north, if you will, instead of just coming in from the sea. Um, so those those three considerations, I think, overdrew everyone, is that um, Wings Weapon uh, were the only people that could get the imagery and the commensurated points for all the offsets and the target points. Um, It was before um, today's digital world and transcribing uh, coordinates was a thing of beauty in those days and cartography and converting into a global, what I call world grid type of coordinate from a projection on a flat map was um, art as much as science. And they were doing that. And uh, we didn't want to lose an air crew behind enemy lines. Didn't want to have any more American pilots captured being held by the Libyans. And we didn't want to get shot down by the Navy. Let, let me ask then, we, we, chronologically, we're sort of, um, I think we're okay. We're, we're where we need to be in terms of the, your journey and the mission. So this is a bit of a segue, but what was the CSAR plan then, the combat search and rescue plan? And, and did you have any particular feelings about how you would behave in different situations? Were you pre-visualizing going down on the ground? Uh, were you pre-visualizing maybe ejecting into the sea? How much time were you spending in these months before the actual mission took place thinking about how you were going to conduct yourself in those um, situations? I don't remember it that much, but I do remember a few things is I'm talking about the raid itself being called on Sunday. And while the wing weapons planners are building the mission, um, some mundane things are occurring there in that squadron uh, to include getting our wheels in order, getting what we call our evasion, escape and evasion cards updated and reviewing that. So if we went down um, the type of information that was going to be used to verify who we were, code words, things like that. So we went through that drill. And then we also um, went through the idea of, you know, the F-111 is a capsule. It's like flying a Gemini capsule. It's supposed to float. And all of us were going to go out over the ocean and attempt to bail out and make it feet wet. And that the chance of a um, land rescue were slim and none. Okay. Um, let me just stay with this sort of early time scale then before before you know the Sunday where you get the call. Um, one of the things I'm I'm curious to explore and understand is is some of the activities that were taking place in those months prior to the raid in terms of preparation. So I had read that uh, I don't know if um, I don't know where I read it or where I heard it, but that that you guys or or somebody in the wing started flying really long missions to see whether or not the airplane Ooh, would stand up uh, to it. Yeah, and um, I am not privy to that. I would, didn't participate. Okay. But there was an exercise, wait for it, wait for it, with F-111Es, okay, <laughs> from Upper Hayford that um, took off from Hayford and did some sort of bomb drop um is it Goose in Bay? Canada yeah. or the US and came back. Yeah. You know, and it was a success and failure. They learned a lot of stuff, but it was analog e models, you know, that were doing it and not us. And it wasn't paved tack. Hmm. Um, and I wish they would have used F models to do that because we would have learned some things about managing the paved tack pod. And one of the things we learned the hard way is do you keep power on that cooling paved tack pod for um, the seven hour trip down there? We 
you know, we didn't have any experience on how to handle a paved tap pod for seven hours. And one of the things we found out is the cryogenic tubes that cool the seeker head rose up, you know, when they are being cooled for seven hours. You know, normally we fly for two to three hours, no problem. Nobody's ever found a cryo tube freeze up. But it turns out that when you cold soak it up at 30,000 or 20,000 feet and keep it on, you know, for seven hours, they freeze up, you know, what, which what, we would have learned that, which we would have known that before we did it, you know. Well, what about uh, deception then? I, I got um, very recently in the last sort of three or four months from, um, I don't know, it came from USAFE. I can't remember which come up. It may have even been ACC. I managed to get the, um, the, debrief from Eldorado Canyon declassified finally I tried so many times and I and I got it a couple of months ago and one of the things it talks about is the deception plan uh it talks about the tankers coming in and using tack call signs instead of sack call signs uh it, it talks about um the scheduling of an exercise at around the time of the raid to be able to to justify all these airplanes arriving you talked about those indicators i suppose this these these this deception plan was intended to provide alternative explanations for those indicators other than we're going to go and strike libya were you doing deception um in those sort of three or four months leading up to el dorado canyon then um no okay however some people may have um you know what i am saying today is the way i remember it not necessarily the way it happened so i am not the keeper of the historical archives and everything that was going on But I can tell you, little old Jose and his um, weapon system operator, we didn't practice any deception. We were just going to take off and go. Now, some of the plans that we were part of is we were going to use a tanker call sign and pretend like we took off from Mildenhall. And the deception was doing everything we can to be a Dobby. Tankers out of Mildenhall were called Dobby and file a flight plan to Siganella as Dobby, uh, pretending like we're a KC-10, and um, just fall off the boom approaching Siganella and go. That was a deception plan, but it was uh, no more fulfilled than what you and I are talking about it right now. It was an idea what, you know, that never got executed. Um, and that was about it as far as I knew. The other deception plan was uh, not talking on the radio, um, not talking to any air traffic control, anything like that. Can you describe a bit more then uh, in regards to the, that 24, 36, 48 hour period up until the actual raid itself? So so I'm really keen to understand the planning process. So you, you arrive at the squadron and there's the armed guard there. You go in, there's a mass brief. Do you then break it out like you would do in, the, in a strike eagle squadron and then sit with your fo- your foreship and do the foreship brief and then do a, maybe... Yeah, so I, um, let me go through that a little bit more. So um, by the time we I got there, probably about one o'clock or something on a Sunday afternoon, the uh, duty desk at the 494th had everybody's name, call sign, and tail numbers, you know, we're going in. Hey, I'm on the board. I'm remit 33. My flight lead is remit 31. And I knew who was in my flight plan. And they put some sort of name and I could go, oh, um, we're attacking Azizi Barracks, you know, um, City Al Salim or something. There were three targets and they were um, divided 666. So three targets, six airplanes on each. It made sense. And um, we made out a lineup card. And there was a mass briefing at about like two o'clock. Just, hey, this is what we're doing. We're, we're, this is kind of like the big plan. We're talking about going tomorrow. Uh, right after this, I need you to get in line for the flight docs. Got some stuff and uh, your uh, escape and evasion things. We're doing the... Um, Uh, what I call the bookkeeping administrative type of stuff. And then later in the afternoon, um, my flight lead um, has a flight brief and he gives us a little bit more detail. And um, 
uh, my Wizzo and I make the decision that we're not going to go home. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk together. We're going to stay at the BOQ um, on base that night. And then we stayed up that night together talking about every aspect of our mission together for about three or four hours. We went through the whole route. Uh, made sure the coordinates that we had were right. We talked about what we were going to do if we lost this, where we were going to go. We identified our divert bases, and we did our homework, Steve. Um, bless his heart. Um, my Wizzo and I, you know, made me go through the pain of going through this whole what-if scenario for everything. We talked about it. The only thing we didn't cover that came to bite me in the butt was um, getting back to the tanker. I was caught off guard on what a long flight that was. I kind of was all focused, getting to the target and surviving. And then I, when it actually came time um, coming off the target, I kind of thought, oh, I just climb, the tanker's there, and we're going to be on them pretty soon. I get my gas and we follow the tanker home. Well, it was about an hour and 20 hour and 30 minute flight to get back to the tanker. Wow. And I wasn't ready for that slowdown, you know, that dead space, you know, that um, catharsis, you know, and let down. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. What about then your journey to the aeroplane? So you, you, you've talked about being in the crew bus. You've got your squadron boss that is, is next to you. You get out of the crew bus and go to your aeroplane. It's armed. What, what's the mood of the, the maintenance guys, the weapons guys? Are they The maintenance guys know something's up. They were just so proud, you know. And um, we all shook hands. Uh, and we all wrote messages uh to a hollywood star on our bombs um that is that went back to vietnam and um so we personalized the bombs and uh, talked to the crew chief and i told the crew chief the target we were going where we were going and I things like him. that he just he was just so proud to be launching that jet you know and then we left the tab v and got into uh, what I call one of the parallel taxiways. They're really not parallel, but it's just one of the feeder taxiways to the end of the runway. And instead of having arming at the end of the runway like we used, like we normally do, because there were so many jets and they wanted to minimize the time frame, they had this massive de-arming um, on this feeder taxiway approaching the runway. Mm -hmm. And one of the pictures that we have is of my jet being armed on that flight, you know, in this string of airplanes. What, what, so they pulled the pins and we armed, and then we um, sh shuttled into the end of the runway. And at the time, looking at our clock and the yellow light from the mobile guy, our flight maneuvered in, took position on the runway. And when that light turned green, the boss released brakes and went. And then 15 seconds, the next, and then the next, and then the next. And we rejoined on the tanker that was taken off out of Millenhall. One of the things that I, I always hear people say um, when I ask them this question um, around their first combat mission, or any combat mission, but in particular their first combat mission, is that the training the training takes over at some point. But But I'm curious to understand how you felt uh, and what emotions you were you were experiencing throughout that period of time. So from the moment you leave and get to the tab V and you start the aeroplane, you look at the bombs, you sign them. Are you are you overwhelmed by the experience? Are you finding it surreal? Um, is it just another day? How are you? How do you? How are you feeling? Looking, and how do you manage those feelings? Looking back, okay, I was overwhelmed. Okay. But I was more concerned with making a mistake and embarrassing my boss than I was about dying. I you know um, I love that man. You know, when I talk about leadership, you know, I can talk about leadership. I can talk about leadership in a staff setting because I loved another leader that I had in a staff setting. But the first guy that I go, oh, my God, what a leader that I would rather die 
and disappoint that man was the commander that was leading that. So I was scared to death of disappointing him more than I was of, um, of not accomplishing the mission or dying myself. So uh, I just didn't want to make a mistake and embarrass him. But I was not prepared for what we were about to do. Steve, that day, I had never in my life flown with live ordnance. I had never, ever dropped a live bomb in my life. I had never, ever had chaff and flares loaded on my airplane. I had never, ever uh, refueled from a KC-10. I had never, ever flown below 400 feet at night, you know? And I'm going to do all these things for the very first time, you know, in a combat setting when the bad guys are doing their best to shoot at me, you know? So it was, I go, um, some of the older heads talk about, oh, I felt really prepared, you know? Uh, the training prepared me well. I, I was the opposite. I go, I haven't trained for this, you know? I don't know where you guys have, but little Jose's been at Lake Eney for a year and two months. And hey, when did we, when did we practice this? You know, because I sure did have it, you know. That's a good question then. I I had read that some of the senior guys on that raid had flown in Vietnam. Um, is that true? Is there were, yes. were they were they yes. offering words of wisdom to you? Uh they were. Okay. And one of the guys, um uh an old head, flew in Vietnam. And um, I hope he comes up in the comments and identifies himself because I'm going to respect you. I'm just not going to name names. OK, but a really great aviator, great guy, um, uh, fighter pilot to the core and General McInerney. You know, when we come to the final plan and the plan. Who comes up with this stuff? We're going to put nine airplanes across the same path going downtown. You know, the, eventually the plan morphs into just nine little Indians in a line coming in on the same line to hit the same target. And McInerney takes him. You know, he's the only guy. There's uh, the leader, uh, one other guy, and this guy were combat vets from Vietnam. And he takes him. He goes, hey, um, when you approach a target, Use your judgment. If it's too hot, if we've lost a couple airplanes, you know, use your judgment to, to call it off. Okay. And all the senior leadership were aware of the danger and the risk of this idiotic plan of sending these airplanes in. And they warned this guy, hey, don't tell these guys, but we've got some serious questions. And if it's too hot and we've lost some airplanes, pull your flight off and don't commit it. Hmm. But he didn't share that with us. You know, he's a gung-ho guy. Later on, I think I'm saying this right, they asked him about, hey, what was the AAA um, coming into Tripoli uh, like compared to what you saw going to Hanoi, you know, during linebacker? And he goes, ah, oh, the AAA was on a scale of one to 10 was about a seven. But the Sams were a 14, you know? The Sams out of Tripoli compared to what you got out of, Han out of Libya. Um, I mean, out of Hanoi was just five, fivefold. And I, I can attest to that too. There were missiles all over the air, Steve, when we got there in the target. Let, let me ask a, a technical question before maybe you could resume and uh, Jim telling us about dropping off the tanker and then going in, into the target area and, and actually and actually getting the job done. Um, one of the things that Puffy12 said to me, and, and, I, and it's also in the um, declassified report, um, after action report for, from, from the Air Force was, that there were uh, you know SAM systems that the Libyans were using, in particular the Kratal, that your raw was not able to see in inverted commas. You know, the, the I think the polarity was wrong or something, you know, it just meant that you weren't going to be able to see it. Were you were you really well briefed on that threat? Did you know about which SAM systems you'd be facing and did you know the strengths and weaknesses of your electronic warfare gear compared to those threats? Uh, how how, yes. how well versed were yes. you on that? Yes, I felt very well briefed and prepared. And we knew the Libyans had crotals. And I knew the capability. And I knew that our 131 pod had effectively no capability against the crotal. Um, but we had our raw 
um, that had some, and it turns out my raw gear coming to the target was full of, of uh, correlated C's, Crotal. So I got plenty of warning of Crotal's okay. coming to the target. Um, so I felt really good about that aspect. And what Mike and I talked about that night as I go, Mike, all these Sams, I go, either we're going to, um, either we're going to honor these warnings or we're not. If we honor one of these warnings, we're not going to hit the target. The, the timing is so short and our window is so small and we're going to be so close to the water. I said, Mike, I'm not that good. You know, if we honor some of these warnings and if we get a missile warning, we're either going to bite our teeth and keep going or I honor it and we abort. You know, what do you want to do? And we decided, hey, we're just going to press through. We're just going to press through, ignore all the warnings. And if we didn't ignore them, we, we wouldn't have hit the target. We couldn't have. You know, we'd turn off, get off, get off course. I'd fly us into the water. And as it turned out, my God, you know, uh, fly us into the water. I'd do something, you know, but you could not honor a raw indication that low, that fast. Okay. And with the timing criteria as tight as it was and still do the mission. You had to do one or the other, bite your teeth or honor. Can you pick up then, Mike, the, um, Jim, the, the narrative on, on then dropping off the tank and, and getting the job done? Um, before I, I get off, uh, off the tanker, there's a couple of stories that are really good. You know, we took off 24 airplanes out of Lake and Heath, and we joined up on to uh, six tankers, KC-10s, that um, took off out of Mildenhall. We didn't say anything to anyone, you know. Uh, we had somebody that went to London Mill, who's the kind of like the uh, controller for that part of the world over the UK, and was telling them, hey, clear traffic. You know, we got these guys, I can't tell you. So there was some deconfliction, but we weren't talking on the radio. When we got the lands in, we hadn't said anything to anybody, but on the but we're monitoring the London Mill channel. And as we're coasting out, the London Mill controller comes up and goes, unidentified aircraft departing lands in, Godspeed. Wow. Wow. That's an indicator, you know? So then we're going south. And um, our six KC-10s rejoin with six more KC-10s. This flight of KC-10s come up, comes up from the side. And those KC-10s, Steve, are on the boom of six KC-135s. So you had tankers from like Spain that had come out and in order to drop off as much fuel as they could, they were refueled first by KC-135s, and then they slung on, and our KC-10s got onto their boom, and we're just hanging on to the boom of our KC-10, and we have this whole armada trucking south, and it is about 30 minutes before sunset, you know, and the sun is going down, but there's at least... 12 KC-10s in my field of view, 18 strike F-111s, 6 KC-135, and I could hear Wagner's cry of the Valkyr, a ride of the Valkyries in my headset, you know? It was just the most awesome example of air power and projection that I think the world had ever seen. No one else in the world could do what was amassed right there at that moment in space. It was a real special moment. So uh, in our flight brief, when we were briefing what to do, our commander uh, briefed that, okay, once we start turning uh, east and we clear Gibraltar, I want, uh, we're just going to play a shell game continuously on the tanker. The tanker was briefed, uh, no radio, no anything, and F-111 shows up, give them gas, you know, and that was the ROE. So once we got through Gibraltar for the last hour flying west, we just did a shell game so that we were always topped up the whole time. So I probably refueled 10 times in the last uh, hour. 
and each time getting a squirt of just 500 pounds. You know what I mean? And then coming off. And we wanted, hey, if something happens, the boom breaks, uh, we get behind, something like that. We've got as much fuel as we can. Okay. It was a smart move. Uh, when we talk about the results later, one of the flights chose not to do that technique, you know, and um, they got to a point where they didn't have enough gas, you know, to get to the target. And I call it just kind of buffoonery, crude buffoonery by not getting the gas that was available. Um, so uh, one of the things that was wrong is that the tanker guys didn't realize it was importing important to hit the intermediate points at the desired time, just not the drop-off point at the desired time. Mm -hmm. So a KC-10 is faster than a 111 with its wings at 26, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So they could push it up and go up to Mach 0.87, Mach 0.9 to get to the end point. And now uh, I, I got to push our wings back. We're going too fast. We can't speed it up. Um, and that got to be a problem. And that also caused some problems. So things that we would have liked to have briefed better is you got to hit your waypoints on time and your drop off point on time so that we're not going too fast the final 200 miles and we can't keep up, mm. you know, because mm -hmm. we had to go into burner and bring the wings back and now refuel with the wings after 26 and the airplane's just hanging in the air um, as you get that high that that transition between Mach number and indicated airspeed, the airplane flies over, well, calibrated, but indicated cal, same thing. It flies on a, on an indicated. So the airplane thinks it's going 270 knots, but that altitude, that's Mach point, uh, eight, seven, you know, so the airplane's on an, on a feather on a prop, but it's going too fast for the wings. I got to bring them back. Um, but, we're playing the shell game and the boss is on the tanker. And when he gets off the tanker, his lights go off and he just drops down. And the next guy goes right in um, and I'm on the right wing. And 30 seconds later, he, he pops in there and he gets his squirt. Probably it's only a hundred pounds. You can see the mist come off the refueling door. He backs down, the lights go out, and he drops away. Who's next? Me, okay? We move in there, get our squirt, 150 pounds, okay? Turn off, lights go out, and we just go into the darkness and um, do our TFR descent immediately. The plan was to get down to 1,000 feet until we get to... Uh, this little island out there in the middle of the med called Lampedusa. So we do our TFR descent and we were up probably in the mid twenties, you know, somewhere around 22, 23,000 there. And we do our TFR descent. We turn off all the lights, kind of do our fence check. You know what we talk about, get things ready. And um, we were flying over an overcast, if you will, and then we descend and we're in the overcast. And when we punch out through that overcast at about like 12,000 feet, Steve, it was like flying in a golf ball. It was blacker than black. We're underneath the stars. There's absolutely no light at all. It was the darkest I've ever flown anywhere in my life. Nothing to see out there in the middle of the ocean. Just absolute nothing. Our, we're coming down at 10 degrees nose low at about 12, about 10,000 feet per minute. And at a uh, lower ring in altitude, which is like 10,000 feet, something like that, the radar altimeter is supposed to ring in and the off leg goes out and the airplane's going to tip over another few degrees. Your descent rate is going to increase, you know, and this big light over here that says reference not engaged, you know, is going to go out. Everything's going to work. Well, the radar altimeter doesn't ring in and we're going through screaming through 9,000 feet. And I still got an off leg in the radar altimeter and our radar altimeter doesn't ring in. Don't know how high we are. So we, uh, I hand fly and we level off at a thousand feet and we're going towards Lampedusa at a thousand feet. 
And we had talked about this. What are we going to do? And we said, hey, uh, as long as we can uh, maintain our attitude and safe, we're just going to keep going. So Mike and I press on without a radar altimeter. And without a radar altimeter, our TFRs don't work. And without our TFRs, you know, we, we, don't, have, we don't have any technology more than the Mosquito pilots did in World War II. You know, we've got an altimeter setting and an attitude indicator and a barometric pressure setting that is now eight, eight hours old, you know. So we pressed on south um, and we were supposed to descend to 500 feet at Lampedusa um, and accelerate to 540 knots as we continued south towards Libya. And we were in a line of nine airplanes offset like about a mile lateral and um, probably five miles aft of each other, if you know what I mean like this, so that when we make the turn, we come out uh, 30 seconds behind each, each guy, if you know what I mean. So we're coming down south. And uh, when I think of a tower, I think of a tower of a couple hundred feet, maybe 100, 200 feet. We drive by them every day on the road. It's just a tower you look up at 200 feet. When I went by Lampedusa, we were below the top of that tower. When we're out over the water, the, that offset and that tower with the red light is up here and we're coming across it like this. And I go, I had no idea how high we are. I don't know how high. If we are 100 feet off the water, 500 feet or 1,000 feet. And um, later on, I checked, that tower is 1,200 feet tall, you know? Wow. So but I thought it was like a two to 500 foot tower. We stayed where we were. The other critical um, uh, decision my WISO made is uh, we had a tight system, really good. You know, he didn't have to do anything when we approached Gibraltar. The system was right on the turn point. The radar fell on all the offsets. Everything was looking sweet. When we approached Lampedusa, the coordinates that we were flying to were out off the coast about a mile from this big tower just off the coast but that tower itself and this little piece of jagged um land were offsets that he could check his system and and make sure that it was tight and when he put his when he selected the offset the crosshairs jumped off that tower um you know not up to a mile but hundreds of feet you know like five to 800 feet. Mm. And Mike goes, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not taking that. Something's wrong. We got a good system and he didn't update. He just kept it. And that's why we hit the target. You know, those were bad coordinates. Okay. And Mike didn't update. He, uh, uh, my Wizzo didn't update. He recognized it for what it was, you know, the experienced guy. And we hit the target others behind us updated on those bad coordinates. And when that time compressed target attack, when they selected the offset to do their final army, their, their crosshairs fell someplace else. Mm. And they didn't have the time to actually refine and do their target. So now we're flying towards Libya. We are kind of committed, you know, hadn't heard boo, hadn't heard anything. And do you remember a movie from the 60s? It was called Failsafe. And it was about an American bomber crew that um, accidentally gets executed and is going against um, the Soviet Union. And the president is Henry Fonda. And everyone is trying to get word to turn this bomber crew back. And they even bring the pilot's wife out and get her on the radio. You know, Harry, it's not real. Turn back, turn back. And it was a great book and a great movie. I'm afraid, inspired the indicators, I'm the only one out here. Everyone has gotten the word that this has been called off, but my crewmate and I, and we are hurtling towards an international incident, you know, because they've turned it off and we're the only two that don't know. 
So we're flying 540 indicated and going towards Libya. And I start clicking the radio just to get that characteristic click, click. Yeah, uh, it kind of sounds like it's working. <laughs> click, click. But I was scared to death. We were the only ones that hadn't gotten the word. The first thing that I heard is when we got to the IP and we shift and we're going now towards um, Tripoli, I can see now um, the lights and the glow of the city in the in the horizon as we're approaching it. And I hear radio chatter. And the first thing I hear is little Max, little Max. And it was some um, Navy pilots with big ones that were circling out there in the middle of the ocean at 500 feet. And they did preemptive harm shots at the known SAM sites. And they did that just before the first airplanes got into range. And so hearing little Max and seeing the harms go up, a half dozen of them, you know, blue trails, sparkles come up in like a formation and go up and go towards uh, Tripoli. Really cool, you know, and that was the Navy and they all launched their preemptive harms in sequence, really close together. And when they launched one, it was little Max. The other thing that was very disconcerting is um, we were supposed to have a tailwind behind us of about 20 to 25 knots. When we turned uh, to the southeast and I'm going towards Tripoli, that wasn't a tailwind, it was a headwind right in our face. And we were supposed to accelerate to 600 knots and the timing was based on 600 knots. And because that same headwind was with us, we got to the IP and I was about 12 seconds slow at the IP. So I turned and we accelerated and I put it into middle power. And my plan was to try to get to 30 knots faster, 630. But we're still, I can see our ground speed indicator. I'm, I'm not getting fast enough. So um, I said, hey, Mike, I got to use the afterburner. So I plug it into afterburner. And my plan is to accelerate to 660 knots for two minutes, you know, make up that time. Um, that jet just lurched immediately when you put it in afterburner. It wanted to go faster. It wanted to do 700 knots. It wanted to do 720. It still had, it wanted to go really fast. And we got thrown in our seats and the glow even behind us just lit up the whole sky. It was like being on a rocket ship, you know, that you know, you've seen the, the images of the astronauts going into space and the glow behind them as those big thrusts. It was like that, Steve. And um, I was task saturated, keeping us out of the water. I was staring at my attitude indicator and the altimeter and the VVI, everything barometric. You know, just staying. I wasn't going to allow us to descend one foot. I was just on it. We came out of burner, um, and because we were attracting AAA fire, I could see the burst fire out there suddenly coming towards us. We were the the biggest light in the sky with our afterburners coming in. So I put those uh, put those out and kept going. The other thing that was annoying is I'm. Um, I'm flying with what I call my hand grabbing the paddle switch. The airplane has a panic paddle switch that you, you paddle that off. And now you are flying the airplane, the TFRs and the flight controls are all disconnected. Your hand flying. So I'm flying with the paddle switch. And I've been doing that since our radar altimeter didn't ring in. And the reason I'm doing that is we still have the TFRs on and I can see a very thin, what I think is the surface of the ocean on the TFR scope. And that's kind of given me a little indication that uh, we're still above the waves. I can see uh, where the terrain is compared to the ride line and where we should be. And that kind of given me a um, positive fuzzy that where we're not about to smack in the water. So I kept the TFRs on. The, the problem with that is the airplane is smart enough to know uh, that the 
terrain fallen radar is not working as normal. And the dash one is full of about 10,000 warnings. Do not hand fly TFR, you know, do not hand fly TFR on a fail safe. Let the airplane fail safe and climb you up. It's the airplane trying to save you. Well, we're doing exactly that. So I've got these big red TFR failure lights in the cockpit. <laughs> TFR fail. The TFR has an audio tone in the headset. When you descend, it's a low frequency. Dun, 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 dun. It's telling you that you're descending. That is commanding a descent. When you're commanding a climb, it's a higher pitch tone. And it goes, dee, 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 dee. And when it's commanding a fly up, it goes, and it's a shrill alarm bell. So I got this alarm bell going on our headset, paddling off the TFRs. And I would have punched that off if I could have, but it's fail safe with the TFR non. But as long as you have the TFR on and the TFR senses a failure, you're going to get that warning. The other thing that I hear is the new guy audio for the raw scope, the ALR 62. It was designed not to be in a high threat environment. You're scooting sites. And when a new threat comes up, it gives you a doo -doo 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 -doo. new radar, new threat. Look, that thing was just constant new guy audio. It was mind blowing. And I would have punched that off if I could have spared a second from looking straight ahead. You know, I was really task saturated looking straight ahead at my ADI and not descending. And I was afraid if I reached to my left and pushed off, pushed down a button, I might push off something I really needed, like the intercom between us or the radio or something like that. So I left it on. But the uh, the oral indications were just deafening. Uh, as we approach the target, uh, my leader throws out a couple of uh, flares, and they look just like missiles coming at me, you know. <laughs> and we saw a bunch of other missiles. When you're going 660 knots, a stationary flare comes at you real freaking fast. And especially when we're flying the exact same path, you know. So here's the flare. 30 seconds later, just right past that flare. And I could just see that flare getting bigger and bigger, just right over. Uh, the Kotals were like, do you ever um, play with bottle rockets as a kid yeah. and shoot bottle rockets yeah. at each other? And if you and if you fire them horizontally, they make sparks and they go <laughs> out over. These Kotals were going everywhere out over the water. They were like sparks and you could see them. <laughs> and they were... They were there. And then the AAA was like you've seen in a lot of different places, whether it's Hanoi, Baghdad, Tripoli, the integrated AAA and the different millimeters all going together. It was a cacophony of AAA. Um, then at the final moment, uh, when it came time to release the bomb, it is that training. And this is what I was prepared for. I'd done this delivery a thousand times and Mike and I had practiced it, you know, 10 seconds to pull, five seconds, paddle, pull, pickle. And I'm already paddled. I pull, get the airplane climbing up and I pickle and we're going to toss our bombs. We're going so fast. We're planning to toss them about 18 to 20,000 feet, uh, about three miles, three and a half miles, paddle, pull, pickle, chaff, chaff, flare and did it from muscle memory. And we're up, bomb's gone, chaff, chaff, flare, wing over. And I immediately, as soon as I start the wing over, I go 19 seconds, chaff, chaff, flare. And we're hanging up in the sky like this, 10 seconds, chaff, chaff, flare. Five seconds, chaff, chaff, flare. And as soon as I hit impact, Mike goes, I didn't get it. Okay, TFR is on. We're trying to get back down low level. And at that moment, I saw the explosion of an airplane into the harbor, uh, right of Bemis. So we're coming in. I do the swing over and I'm here. And I can see a explosion right of Bemis right here. 
and it looks like napalm out over the water that goes over the um, uh, towards the harbor. It was obvious, still feet wet, never coasted in, but it was out over the bay. Uh, I didn't put it together that we lost an airplane at that moment. It was the biggest explosion that I had seen. I thought maybe somebody had released a bomb, uh, a ship had exploded, something. It could have been anything. I didn't put it up that we had lost an airplane until we started checking in at the tanker uh, an hour and a half later. So once we got off the target, man, Mike and I are time compressed. We're on our A game. The adrenaline is really flowing. We are sucking some oxygen. Our brains are really working hard. And we sequenced to the D Lao ship. And the D Lao ship was what the Navy called this robo frigate that they put out over the coast. God love them. But the idea was that they were, we didn't think that the Libyans would respond and do anything. But if they did, the last thing the Navy wanted was a furball out over Tripoli and not being able to distinguish friend from foe. So they, one of the things we said was, hey, only a freaking idiot Air Force guy would fly directly over a ship, you know, at less than a thousand feet. And anybody over a thousand feet is going to get shot down trailing that d ship. Wow. So we went over that ship. And as soon as I released the bomb, I put the wings all the way back to 72. I didn't like the afterburner because I saw what that had done. And I parked the throttles and mill power. And we just went straight at that ship. And I could see it in the horizon. And I could see the ride line. And I descended to 500 feet because I didn't want him to shoot me at 1,000. And we went over that ship at about 662 knots, you know, which was and and debrief one of the colonels or generals um, is looking at my tape and he goes, Jose, did you go? Why did you go over the D Lao ship at 662 knots? And I said, because it wouldn't do 663. That was as fast as it went, you know. So we get off the D Lao ship, and that's when I, uh, okay, we relax. I pull the throttles back. I move the wings up. We start our climb. I remember our tanker refueling altitude at like 22.5. And I climb up to 22.5, and I tell Mike to sequence to the um, anchor point. And it's sequenced there. And time to go is like an hour and 20 minutes, Steve. And I go, what? What? And I'm looking at my gas. And I go, geez, we got 8,000 pounds of gas. Shit, I'm going to get there at like 3,000 pounds of gas. Holy crap. We got to get on this tanker, you know? And nobody wants to help us. Red Crown, who is the, uh, is the Navy um, E2, it's still working the strike free. They're still working the recovery of the Navy jets. They're still working um, the response from the Libyans. You know, the last thing they need to do is to um, hand feed, baby feed some Air Force dude and put him on the tanker, you know. So we're just flying in the darkness. And I look over and my Wizzo, bless his heart, he, he's had it, you know, flying with me for the past seven hours. And when we just went through, knowing that he was going to die at any moment, he's just off by himself for a while, you know, in this catharsis. And I think we both now realize we've lost an airplane and know who it is. So we're thinking our own thoughts and I'm, I'm crashing too. And that's when I decide I, I, I got to be on this. I take my first go pill. So I take my go pill and that really bucks me up. But we're approaching the tanker, and I told you we had that overcast at about 21,000, something like that. Steve, we we get up to our refueling fuel, and I'm in the cirrus, you know, not cloud, but that cirrus muck. And poor Mike is just exhausted, you know. He's just sitting there. And the first time we get there, 
and we're at 22.5, and I, fl I flew through the formation of these tankers, you know, six tankers, all these airplanes, and, and it's, oh, my God, it scares you to death. You know, when we talk about control at night and stuff, I, uh, we were probably had 500 foot separation, you know, because I was on altitude. I think they are, but that's just too close, you know, and especially when you didn't see them coming and you weren't prepared. So I rank it into uh, an F 111 bat turn, which is no turn at all. And uh, I'm just trying to turn as fast as I can to get going the same way as all those airplanes. And about the time I get going that way, they're on the other side of the circle. You know, they're back in the other deal. And now I'm looking at my gas and I've got 2,200 pounds of gas. And um, 2,200 pounds of gas in the F-111 is like 2,200 pounds of gas in an F-15 or an F-15E or an F-4. I burn 100 pounds per minute up at altitude, 200 pounds per minute low level. I got 20 minutes. If I do nothing, you know, if I do everything and I still got to fly to Sigonella, you know, and Sigonella is a 15 minute flight, you know, and that's assuming everything works right. We need gas right now. I mean, right now. So I get on the freak and I go, hey, boss, this is three, three. Can you come up squadron, which was our squadron um, unique freak that only guys in the 493rd did. So he comes up. And he goes, uh, Jose, what you need? And I go, hey, I've only got 2,200 pounds of gas and I'm having trouble finding you guys. I can't see you in this Merc, you know. Um, can you talk me to this rejoin? First off, I need to put eyes on you. You think you can torch so I can get eyes to you? And then you um, feed me your headings so I can do this geometry and get on. And that's exactly what he did, bless his heart. He told the tanker he was going to torch and I saw him out there immediately and he goes, okay. And I said, Hey, I've got you. What's your heading? And he goes, Hey, we're, uh, you know, turning left through something, something. Okay. And I was able to do a fighter rejoin and get on him. We got on his wing with about 1800 pounds of gas. And when I took my first squirt, geez, I probably had about 10, 12 minutes of flying time. You know, when I finally got that, um, my squirt of gas. And I was the last person on the tanker, you know, Wow. Um, when we got on. Um, shortly thereafter, um, uh, one of the guys said, come up on HF on BBC, which we all knew the free. And uh, we're listening to, you know, a name, Kate Elder? Kate, Kate um, 80, Kate 80? Kate, Haiti. 80, uh, 80. Haiti, yeah. Um, she was the BBC correspondent for that night. And we listened to Kate all the way home. And um, I, I really want to talk to her about that one night because they also had another BBC correspondent that was on one of the Libyan hotels on the balcony, on the roof of the hotel, giving a live um, a, a live uh, interview or uh report of the strike happening and she played that segment about a half dozen times as we're flying back to the uk and that segment is this guy you can you can hear the machine guns and the triple a going off the sky is full of shells um and ah! and you hear this rumble roar of this airplane and there's only one airplane that makes that kind of sound and that's an f-111 and grunt and it was the high time guy uh, who um, made it all the way to the coast that realizes he doesn't have it. His Wizzo doesn't have it, puts it into Grunt and does this low level turn over downtown Tripoli and flies right over the roof of that hotel. And for 10 seconds, it was what I described earlier. You know, the world shakes when an F-111 and Grunt comes over that that loud and um it was it was humorous we listened to kate all the way back uh as we we're approaching uh lands in and the sun's coming up we'd seen the sun go down on that route now we're watching the sun come up 
as we're coming up at SR-71, and they went out of their way to do this, flew right over us, about 2,000 feet over us, flapped its wings, because it was going to go take pictures of what we had just done, you know, and it rocked its wings and flew right over us, and that was no accident, you know. And um, then as we are, uh, the sun's coming up, um, Kate plays God Save the Queen, and then the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, so it was real kind of emotional as we came back to the UK. So we're coming back and we've had this mission and we want to fly down initial like nothing, like nobody's business. The tanker pilot wants to fly. He wants to have, a, and I think it was a she was the pilot of the tanker. And she wants to have three fighters on her wing and we're going to fly down initial. Well, that makes me blue four. I'm on the I'm on the right. We come down on 06 at Lake and Heath, and we're trying to fly down initial at 1500 feet, and we're still in the weather. And I'm flying on the wing in the weather. God, please don't, please don't let me hit anybody. Please don't let me hit anybody. And we fly down and we can't do it. So then we stay in echelon and we go to the outside and we split off and we do individual, um, uh, instrument approaches to landing. The first guy to land is the commander. Uh, he has grease on his brakes. Uh, 111 brakes smoke all the time. They see his brakes smoking. They put them off into the penalty box at the end of the runway and have his brakes checked out. The next guy to land was the high time guy we talked about that uh, went downtown in Grunt. Um, he's his jet is assigned a tab V on the far side of the base, the green section. So he goes and turns that way. The next guy to land is me, and my tab V is the first tab V off the end of the runway, right there. I pull off, I pull into the tab V, and there's six blue cars with white tops. And as I'm being winched back into the tab V, I can see one of those dudes has scrambled eggs on his hat, and it's the chief of staff of the Air Force. He is there, and he wants to greet his boys that just came back from the mission. Okay, We shut down, and now i got to get up out of this cockpit. And I've got all kinds of stuff. I call it I had 10 pounds of crap for a five-pound arm. I had a pistol, ammunition. I had two flight bags. I had my helmet because no fighter pilot climbs out of a cockpit with their helmet on. That we call it moonwalking, you know? And so I had my helmet. I had uh, uh, an old box lunch. I had a water bottle. I had the code books. I had the spare pistols. I had all the stuff that I slung on my left arm because I kept my dominant arm for my two piddle packs. I had two packs full of piss and I didn't want to drop those babies, you know? And so I gingerly get up out of the seat and I go to the ladder and I climb down the ladder. And as soon as I get off the ladder, there is General Gabriel and he looks at me and I'm like this and he reaches and I hand him my two piddle packs and he takes them with his left hand, okay? And that frees up my right hand. And he takes his hand and we shake hands as I give him two packs of piss. So when I, the only time I've really met the chief of staff of the Air Force, I handed him <laughs> two packs of urine. That's <laughs> Did he say anything? What did you say? Did he say anything? Hey, welcome back. What was it like? What was it? Because he turned like this and gave it to one of his <laughs> aides was a lieutenant colonel. So he only had possession of it for like three nanoseconds, you know, and gave it to his lieutenant colonel who held it for the rest of our brief time together, you know? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So what happens next then? You do you go and do, do you go and debrief immediately? Do you download? Yeah, the we tapes? did. So 
we went into um, the same yeah. squadron. Everyone else is there. And it was kind of um, an excitement, excited melancholy. You know, hmm. we were pumped up and I'd taken another go pill uh, approaching lands in. So I'm pretty fired up. You know, it was like, not that I've taken cocaine, but it, I'm on cocaine. You know, I'm ready to go. And um, we go in and we play our tape and I debrief. And that probably takes about an hour. And they say, okay, Jose, go home. And okay. So I went home, but I'm ready to go. I went home and I cut the grass. I cut the grass and I washed the cars. And my wife was um, at work at Mildenhall. And um, her colleagues go, did you hear? We just bombed Libya. We just bombed Libya. It was F-111s. Hey, what does Jim say? And my wife goes, I don't know. I haven't seen him for a couple of days, you know? And she just had no idea that um, it was me or that I was involved at all. You said during the course of the attack then, so you've, you've done the pull paddle, uh, the uh, pickle paddle pull or paddle, paddle, yeah. whatever the way it went right around it yeah. is, you pulled up and you're, you're banking over to turn away from the target area and you said you're getting the countdown from your wizzo and he says, I didn't get it. Does that mean you didn't get the video, the pave tack video? No, we the got the video, team? but um, he's working the radar and doing a radar solution until release. And then he switches to bring up the pave tack imagery. And in a good system, the pave tack would slew to where the radar cursors were. So um, they didn't. So he's having trouble finding the target and where the target should have been that he could have lazed and designated the spot. There's the smoke and debris from the leader's bombs because the wind is coming at us instead of away from us. Yeah. So the smoke and debris from the Leeds bombs obscures his field of view and he can't see the target. So he never designates and lazes the target, but our bombs were a ballistic hit exactly where they were supposed to go. You were dropping GBU-10 then? Yeah, GBU-10s. Okay. Uh, 2,000 pound uh, bombs, laser guided bombs. Ours were unguided. They just went ballistically, which was what the airplane um through a map well, one of the things that i'm curious about with the with regards to the debrief i spoke to jim rochamel um fa fairly yeah. recently he, he shared uh, some um spreads from his forthcoming book on the raid which will be out yeah. in in april i think 2024 um and i w w watched the presentation that he did for um, new zealand aeronautical society i think it was and it's fascinating but he at the end of that presentation provides two videos of weapon system video from the raid um, and i think it's in the book excerpt he sent me or maybe he says it in the presentation itself that that there were guys in suits who took all your tapes away before you could make copies of them you know they were whisked away and presumably taken to um the white house or wherever it is they were they were going to go to to be played for the the dignitaries to, to watch um is that a your recollection as well did you did you get a chance to i remember I remember being able to watch our tape, okay, but nobody else's, and not being able to make a copy and losing possession of a tape. Normally, an air crew gets to keep their tape. It's to keep their tape. So we reviewed our tape and debrief. Um, and I oh, and I did see um, the leader's tape, the two hits. Uh, I saw that 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 morning. We saw that. But yeah, all the all the tapes were then collected, and I no longer had access to them. When you say you no longer had access to them, but they were classified beyond your, um, your reach. I, did, they were physically I didn't know uh, they if they were available. I didn't know how to go get them, where they were stored, who had possession, um, uh, any of that. Okay. What what the, what are the implications of that? Well, I don't think it's sinister at all. I took it as normal. I took it as one, um, this, this mission had a lot of, not a lot, it had some buffoonery. And I think part of that was um, the Air Force corporate mindset to control release of some of the buffoonery. 
and there were some controversial things. How did the how did the French embassy get bombed? How do you get an airplane that doesn't lose um, that doesn't leave from the tanker? What about the airplane that had an emergency and had to land at Sigonella? Um, what do we know about the air crew that went down? Um, and what do we know about the systems on the airplane and our raw gear and our 131 gear that's on all these tapes and on pave tack and our tactics? So, of course, they were secret, you know, and very personal close hold. And um, so I think part of that was corporate Air Force trying to control the buffoonery and and also control um, secure, sensitive information. And also still we were in the um, trying to figure out what happened and debrief. And we had a lot of people looking at those tapes in a lot of different ways for like up to a week afterwards, you know, and some and they were being looked at um, not just at Lake and Heath, but in some other secure places. So I, I do believe they went off someplace um, to be looked at closer. And then uh, I couldn't look at them anymore. One of the things that's in this report uh, that I got declassified was the interference with the TFR. I know that's not an issue for you because you weren't using the TFR yeah. uh, properly, but the inter interference with the TFR um, and then issues with the rat out. Um, so you said your rat out failed. Um, but this report, uh, the declassified report, uh, calls, calls out in particular in the ability i think for the tfr to interfere with the radalt was that something well you knew i don't about think before? i i didn't hear that the tfr and the radar altimeter are not interfering but um with that many f-111s and that proximity flying the same course the 111s could interfere with each other and that's the way that i understood it is that um, because we were so close and lined up in the same azimuth that um, a lot of people were getting TFR interference from somebody else's TFR, and that was causing a commanded climb. Here's a, a question for you then. Your rad out, was that a go, no-go item? Uh, it was before takeoff, you know, and I did my, it was a Preston test, good, you know, and when we were, before we, um, decided uh, that the spares would turn around, we all went out and did uh, TFR checks and as many checks as we could on the airplane. Without a doubt, our airplane was 100% effective, okay? And the only way we found out that it didn't is that it did not ring in on our descent, and we wouldn't have known that in, until descent. Hmm. Do you have... Uh... It's a bit of a closed question, but but do, did you have or do you have um, a recurring visions of that? I mean, because because the thing that that you have to, as a listener, that you have to remind yourself of this story is that you're not looking out the window saying, "I don't really know how I am." It's pitch black. You're just looking at this round instrument with some, you know a couple of strip tapes left and right of it, and and trying to control a bunch of parameters by looking at those instruments without knowing how high you are. And I suppose if you're listening to the story and you haven't experienced it, it must be difficult. It is difficult to understand how frightening that must have been. Um, do, did you have any uh, recurring nightmares or thoughts about that experience? Did it impact you in any way? Or did you did you brush it off? And it was just a, another experience as a fire pilot? It was, um, it was really hard to get back to a normal training environment. You know, suddenly, you know, it would have been really easy to go, hey, all these rules don't apply. You know, hey, I've been there. And hey, without, um, I can tell you that uh, when the time comes, they're going to ask you to break all these rules. So they're really not that important. So that would have been a cavalier and dangerous attitude to take. And I had those thoughts, but I have thought about that mission a lot, Steve. I still dream about it. You know, when I have um, to this day, my wife will say, I wake up and I'm in sweats and I'm thinking about um, the intensity of that last 30 seconds. You know, um, I have never experienced anything that has come close to that kind of intense moment. Um, 
The other thing that I always, that I rehash is what I could have done to help my crewmate get the laser on the target. I think, God, why didn't I say, look for the smoke? Why didn't I direct him and go, Mike, look for the smoke, look for the smoke, you know, where the leads bombs hit, you know, that would have put him in the general direction and he might have recognized something, you know, why didn't I say that? Well, hell, because I'd never said that before in my life, you know, um, my job wasn't to direct his eyes onto the target. My job was to keep us out of the water, hmm. you know, but, you know, I relive that what we could have done better or differently. And I'm come, I, I normally come up short. I think we did fine by staying alive. Jim, tell me, tell me about Karma 5-2. You, you said you saw that the airplane impact the, the sea. You talked about in the moments leading up to that, you had seen the crow towels, the crow towels rather, you know, flying, be, being fired off at you. You would said you'd seen correlated indications on your roar. What is your theory on what happened to, to Karma 5-2? Um, there's a difference of opinion. And I don't think anyone can object, objectively say um, one way or the other. Um, but I can tell you a few anecdotal stories and what I think most of us believe. Um, before that mission, Fernando and I were friends. We were good friends. We had sons that were the same age. So we uh, often talked about our sons. We were both Catholics. He was a devout um, church going Catholic. Um, I was an occasional Catholic, um, but he was really devout. Um, he was nervous. He was shook up before the flight. You know, I could just see it. Um, and part of it is instead of being the third guy across, he was going to be number eight, you know, and, um, he was an experienced, good aviator. And maybe he knew something I did, you know, but, um, I could tell he was sh shook up. Um, the other thing that I think we realize that we think is we think he was hit by an SA-6 and the ejection sequence was interrupted by impact with the water. So the body that was recovered has um, severe um, contusions and impact marks of a high energy impact, you know, where you can see where the straps were um, the zipper on um, different high energy, but it had to have been, you know, it's a capsule, capsule separation, something. So I think the, the best or the best, um, I guess, collection of evidence would say he got hit by a missile, probably an SA-6 and um, the airplane impacted the water and interrupted a ejection sequence. What, why do you think SA6? Because uh, they were there. And um, our pods had a very low capability against the SA6. And the crow towels were all being aimed visually. You know, hmm. it would have been a would have been a hell of a good shot for a crow towel to get them. Did you, in the squadron, then in the the days and the the weeks and the months following that, did did you did you ruminate much on? I mean, how how do you deal with the loss of a friend then, or or, or not necessarily the confirmed loss of a friend? You, you, I mean, did you have a sense that he was alive? Uh, him, you know, Paul, Paul Lawrence was the the wizard, but did you have a sense that either of them was alive, or did you think about it? Do you have to put it to the back of your mind? How do you, how do you get on with things? Um, I didn't put it away. I didn't classify it any differently than other plane crashes. Those of us that have flown um, fighters and airplanes like this know a lot of accidents. And to me, I didn't classify it any differently than um, an airplane crashing on a training accident and flying into the ground or Karma 5-2 crashing going into Libya. It is different. Um, but I classified the loss of a friend and comrades the same way, you know, whether you're lost in a training accident or coming up to the coast of Tripoli, it was a loss the same way. 
Tell me, Jim, about then the impact that the your participation on the raid had on the rest of your career then. I mean, we, I'm looking forward to being able to explore that with you in the in the coming interviews that we're going to do. But um, is it something that stayed with you? Did it influence the way you operated either as a squadron boss at the end of your career or as a fighter pilot as you went through your career? Absolutely, because it gave me credibility, uh, immediate credibility that nobody else had until Desert Storm, you know? So it gave me a leg up where I could um, I could say something and people gave me the benefit of the doubt to listen or gave me credibility. And that was five years before um, the rest of the Air Force got it. Hmm. So, you know, this was the first mission that we'd really done since Vietnam. And um, I really felt privileged to be part of it and to be a firsthand witness of the projection of uh, American air power. The, you know, there, you can argue that on a tactical scent, there was a lot of failures that night, uh, especially when you talk about, hey, we only had three hits with uh, 18 airplanes. How do you call that success? Um, but I would say what was successful was the practice of a national political will, our political leaders expending that capital in what was a daring and difficult decision to finally in a collective roar tell the world we have had enough you know and that is what that mission did it was a scream to the world we have had enough and you continue this crap this is what you can expect and um i think for that reason it was a huge success what were your feelings as as an individual and, and collectively then as a squadron or as a wing even when when the navy uh, ordered you the presidential unit, unit citation but the air force was reluctant to to sort of heap the same sort of praise on you remember that when i talked about being at pilot training and then being a fape and everybody wanted to go to an f15 or an f16 you know the air force has always had a stepping stone. Let's judge a pilot by the type of airplane they fly. And the F-111 has always been a redheaded stepchild in the tactical air force of the F-111. You know, hey, I don't know why you call it an F. There's nothing to do with a fighter. You know, it should be B-111. And you hear that all the time or an A-111. And that's valid, you know. Um, so you have that. And I think it was like when it finally came time for the Air Force to do something that was meaningful in a political and force employment way, the only airplane they had that was capable was the F-111. It was the F-111 because they had no other choice or they would have sat out and given the whole thing to the Navy again, you know, and the Air Force had sat out of these little skirmishes that the Navy seemed to find itself all the time because we didn't have an airplane that was capable. But to fly that long and that precise from where you had a safe refueling and back, the only airplane in the world that could have done that was the F-111. Jim, my, my final question for you before, before I wrap up with you. Um, one of the things that I find really curious, and I didn't say this at the beginning, but it makes sense to say it now, is I think you're the first person in on the raid who has who has publicly acknowledged their participation in it. Um, Puffy one two, as I said, I interviewed him, and he said to me, "If you want to name me, you can." And I thought, well, not my job um, to name you. If you want to be in the public domain, you want your name out there, you can do that. That, but I'm not going to do that. And then, you know, you know potentially take heat for doing it so i said to him well no we'll just keep it as it is what is the um reticence amongst the the raiders to 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 make their names public to um acknowledge their participation you know, in in public when we landed um i told you you know i went home and i cut the grass and i washed the car um but it was obvious to all of us, hey, this isn't over. This could just be the beginning. And our wing went on alert for a reattack. 
and another strike. Uh -huh. We were afraid the Lib Libyans or somebody was going to strike out. So we were prepared to do it all again, preparing, okay? I don't think that was really credible, but that was what we were planning. And the military always plans and gets ready for everything. The other thing is there were some um, intelligence that uh, operatives in the UK were going to target those that were responsible. Um, and the base, I don't know if a base can go on lockdown when it's already locked down. But security to get on and off that base got much harder immediately after the raid. And one of our um, crew members that was on the raid um, had um, a foreign operative caught taking pictures of his house. And that scared the crap out of all of us. And we were afraid that if our um, identity became public. Um, foreign operatives, Libyans, were going to um, terrorize us or our families. Mm. So we were very reticent to be publicly acknowledged. <coughs> and none of us wanted to admit that we were on the raid. So it was hush hush to a point. Um, through the years, and especially after Gaddafi has left power, most, I would say, a good many of us, if not most of us, have given up on all of those considerations. Come on, you want to come kill a 67-year-old fat guy? Come on. You know, it's been 40 years, you know. Where were you 40 years ago, pal? You know? So uh, we think the statute of limitations has run out. And I myself have published something in Air and Space Magazine where I admit it was me. Um, my my um, crewmate and I have been interviewed together and we're on a news article. Um, nothing to where we go out and we're making a road show, but isolated things that have identified different players has come out. Mm -hmm. And we just had a reunion at Lake and Heath. Those of us that were there were on the raid. There was no qualms about identifying ourselves and talking about it. Uh, we've had other reunions and the participants have been um, recognized and identified. So there still might be a few holdouts, but um, for the most part, I think we all think uh, it's over with and just part of history. Well, Jim, I'm very grateful to you and I'm sure the audience is as well for sharing your recollection and your experiences as, as a central component of that history. So thank you very much for joining us. Hey, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to the next time.